Alright, it's time to start I guess. So here goes nothing. I have been studying how to make an emulator work from the standpoint of um, this guy by books Mal Malonov and this guide was written for making an emulator in Rust but I am going to make it work with Godot and she script so I will skip all the part of the introduction and the description of the platform and let's go strive to code Let's get in started. Let's try to interpret our first program. The program looks like this. And this program, when disassembled, looks like this one that you're looking here. Uh, the first command is LDA, which stands for Load in Register A. Um, I am taking that anyone interested in this uh, has a knowledge of more or less of how the NES work and because I am alone right now I have no reason to, to explain it to myself so, let's get started Here we go. Um, and the A spec shows that the opcode A9 has one parameter. The instruction size is two bytes, one byte for operation, uh, and the other for a parameter. Nest opcode can have no explicit parameter or one explicit parameter. I have seen. Uh, never mind. Uh, for some operation, the explicit par parameters can take two bytes. Yeah, that is what I was going to, to mention. And in that case, the machine instruction would occupy three bytes. It's worth mentioning that some operations use CPU registers as implicit parameters. So this is the first sketch of how the CPU for this uh, Rust emulator looks like and we see that it has a class for the CPU with a register with an unsigned it byte unsigned 8 bit integer and unsigned 8 bit integer for status which is the flag that are uh, store the status of the last operation and a program counter or PC that is um, well, it's like what is the line of the of the assembly code that is going to run next in an unsigned 16 bits in integer and in the implementation it has a, a new function that initializes and a to do interpret or run function so let's get started with that, I guess. So the one thing I wanted to make in this project uh, was making sure that... Um, I, I wanted to, to make it like solid in a way that I can later uh, reuse a lot of stuff to, to make it work in... Uh, for for, the, for other platforms and not only the NES. So what I want to do is making a base class for a CPU that I can reuse for the NES and for the Z80 for the Game Boy. So let's start. I may I maybe should uh, change the scale of the editor 
for the viewers. Mm -hmm. Let's give it a 1.5 scale. That looks a little bigger, I hope. So let's move on. Let's create a new folder for add-ons because I want to distribute this emulator as an add-on that you can download from the asset view. And let's create a folder for the NES emulator. Or maybe let's rename this to Retro Console Emulator. Because uh, I, I don't know, maybe eventually I will have uh, support for the for the seat 80 uh, variant. So let's go to the to create hardware based places. Let's go with the um, How would I call the base? I don't want to create a base folder. Let's name it interface. And let's create in here a new script called TPU. And let's make it inherit ref counter instead of node. Uh, because we don't really want this to run as part of the of the scene inheritance. Or maybe we will eventually, but should not be needed. We want to have full control on what orders uh, everything runs. So let's keep this class a class name. CPU. And I might eventually give all the classes in this uh, add-on a prefix so it does not collide with anyone uh, downloading it and using it but let's let's start with this so what I wanted to have in this uh, class was a register dictionary so instead of having one variable per dictionary you would have uh, um, one way to access the mal plus um, a variable specific to your um, uh, CPU for accessing it. So let's start with the program counter or PC. Or um, all CPUs will have a program counter, so there is no need to make in one, one new variable for each uh, in each platform. So we have a program counter class uh, register, and we can create the PC counter. And equal it to the program counter. Now there is a problem with this and that is that program counter as an integer would be an atomic value and that is not what I want, right? So wh what comes next is uh, creating a class for register uh, and I will do it at the bottom 
and I want the resistors to be part of the CPU class. So there the would be a couple of types of resistors. There is no specification for that. So, but the, there are basically three types that I want to address once. The 8-bit register, the 16-bit register, oops, that was supposed to be a comment, and the flux register. So these three are the three kinds of registers that, that I need for the NES. So let's get started with that. So class register uh, A bits so it has a value of type integers in Godot all integers are of type uh, of 64 bits so there is no way around it uh, I don't have the all the variants that uh, the uh, that rules has for selecting signet and unsignet and the number of bits of each of them, but uh, that that should not be a problem if our implementation is good enough to avoid it anyway. So, um. The PC counter is a register of 16 bits. The status is a flag uh, register, and the A register is an 8-bit re register. So we have one of each in this first draft uh, of the of the um, tutorial that I am following. Let's get it started. I have a value of integers and now I can just um, use this type instead of an integer and I can just make it equal to a new register so when the when the CPU is instantiated it will create a new register for the program counter, which by the way this one should be the 16 bits one let's fastly duplicate this to make the 16 bit version and let's create a class the flags also with a value and we can have methods to get and set uh, flags giving the the index of the flag but let's wait until later for doing that there is no reason to rush right now so right now our CPU has a program counter register and eventually it will have some more so let's create a folder for, for the NES emulator and let's see how is the CPU of the NES name it. Let's give it a check. So the NES CPU is based on the 6502 chip but the real name is 2A03 so le let's use this for code instead
have to be careful to not forget to swap screen. So let's go to let's create a new script palette nest cpu and let's inherit cpu Class name will be NES CPU and let's add as a comment fifty five oh two, I think. Uh, yes. 502 that's correct so on top of the program counter this uh, class will also have uh, register a of 8 bits Did I copy the name of the class correctly? Yes, I did. And X and Y. And when I initialize this function, I want to add these new registers to my register variable. So let's add. Oops, A X and Y And of course the the flag Which is the register flag <laughs> So um, I will end up probably end up uh, overriding this class making a specific method for each one of the flags so I don't need to to do arithmetic operations in the future. I can just set true or false to a variable, and that should be all. And it will set uh, the bits or read the bits of the value uh, variable. So. For now this one is more or less done, so what we want is a virtual function call it I will not call interpret, I will just call it one. Let's make the to do comment in here just like it is on the On the so the plan is. Each version of a CPU that I make should have its own run virtual method, and it should show an icon, an icon here showing that this is an override. 
But that's correct. That's that's not a problem. So let's go back to our example. So I think we have everything we have in here. We even have the other registers that we will be using. Uh, interpret is called run now. Um, this version takes uh, the program as an argument. So let's do that. It says P for parameter program. And it is a packet byte array, which is a vector of 8 bit uh, integers. Is, is the only case where 8 bits is something uh, valid. So, ba -ba -bam. the operator brackets will return you an int, not an 8 bit integer. So, it will always be an 8 bits, but it will be stored in a 64 bit integer because of how Koto works. Koto has uh, uh, dub typing. I always use type hints to force uh, Koto to to know and set what are the types of variables. But in the end, it is all uh, cosmetic. And in the background, all everything is called is stored inside the variant, so it will not make. Uh, any any change so what I want to do in this virtual run method is adding an assert assert false this method should be implemented in inherited class so Whenever a, a program is run, it, this code should never re be reached here. If we want to run this this project, so right now I don't even have a scene to run. So let, let's create a, a test scene. Just for the sake of it, for the test. And let's let's create. Oops. A test nest. Uh, thin. And now we can just select this scene to to run it. And you cannot see. The, it doesn't matter what is on the on this on the scene that we're running, but the thing is, we may get errors saying that this asset um, is always false. But apparently, I already turned off that uh, that warning. Yeah, let let look into that. Actually, does this show? Oh, that's bad. Hmm. So it's not showing pop-ups. Can I disable embedded sub windows in the editor? This embedded menu. But let's give it a a, a try. Save and restart. See, can you look at this now? No, you don't. Hmm. So, I guess I will have to make some changes and share my entire screen instead of just uh, the Koto um, editor. 
So choose the moment. Create a new. Select the screen one. Done. And now I will hide some stuff that I don't want to show. And call it a day, I suppose. Yep. Uh, yes, I, I want to make sure this does not appear on top of my alerts. Let's test that. Yeah, looks correct. Looks like I follow it myself. So now you can theoretically see my pop-up here. So, sorry for the technical difficulties. This is my first stream, after all. I am taking a drink. Anyway, so... Uh, looks like the warnings for shitty script are disabled for assertion. Assert always false, it says warn. Alright, oh, it's because this assert should be true, not false. That's why we did not see the warning. Okay, it, I am also not creating a CPU, so that's also why we are not getting an assert. So, ne. But CPU equals ne CPU dot new. And when I run this, it's also not showing an asset. Okay. What if I create a CPU instead? Okay. Not not getting a, a warning. That's strange. Anyway. Should be creating a warning because this asset is always true. But uh, I will not complain for now so let's move on and let's go to the tutorial that I am following uh, note that we introduced the program counter regi register that will help us track the current position in the program also note that the interpret method takes a mutable reference of self. Uh, we don't need that. As we know that we need to modify register A during execution. The CPU works in a constant cycle. Fetch new execution instruction from the instruction memory, decode instruction, execute instruction, repeat the cycle. Let's try to codify exactly that. And this example initializes the program counter and then starts a loop where it fetches the opcode, increases the program counter, and then executes whatever is inside. So let's do exactly that. We already have, so let's initialize program counter um, and let's enter the loop instead of while true I will choose saying that the program counter is less than the program size this will change soon anyway 
and it says opcode equals program and then the value of the program counter so let's try to do that p program so what did i do wrong okay, invalid opcode int and left oh right this is value the uh, program counter dot value and no need for casting so we have a program counter and now we can match the value of the program counter and we have a to do here oh right this I, I want to match the opcode so far so good and let's look now nah, it's gonna be right now let's implement LDA so the first things it does is getting the parameter and from the program counter and advancing the program counter let's do that so the the opcode for LDA is A9 and let's get the bar param equals to P program program counter dot value we are reading the new the new value uh, that will be an integer by the way and we increase the program counter And by the way, I forgot to do exactly this in this line. Now we have the, va the variable. We have to set it in the register A. Register A dot value equals param. Oops, that was in here. And we should now set the flags. If the new value is zero, we set the zero flag. If the new value is um, negative, we set the end flag. So we should start by creating some stuff for the flags. if param equals to zero to do that c flag if param uh, it's and How do I specify a binary in Koto? Hmm. Was it one zero 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 B? One two three four five six seven eight. Yep. It's like this invalid numeric notation. Let's try the same notation as in Rust. Yep. So it's zero B and then the binary binary number. That's how it works in Goto apparently. That's good to know. 
I will be using this. Uh, let's duplicate this comment and let's change it for set negative flag. So, so far so good. We are not doing anything crazy here, just following the spec and using Godot constructs to do binary arithmetic. So I guess I should get, get the flags part working before moving on. Um, so what I want in my CPU class, because this is something that will be uh, reuse it often, I hope, is having a class for a flag. So this, uh, so let's call it bit flag. So this bit flag class will have a, a bit uh, member so this is which of the bits will be set or unset like 0, 1, 2, 3 etc and I want A set method that takes a boolean and a get method. That will return a boolean. Uh, apparently, this is a uh, uh, what's the name of the word? Uh, mm, I, I I don't remember the name, but it's a word that I cannot use because it's already used. So let's call it set bit and get bit and let's name it to bit order <laughs> and bull should have a and a big b <laughs> anyway uh so this is to do for now so when we create a bit flag we get two parameters one is the register that we are listening to And the other is the bit order. So, ba, da, da, da. we don't need bit order to be exposed because we are not going to read it. But we want, and we don't need to expose us the register. Um, 
tiempo. So, in this initialization, we are going to set these two values. Uh, let's invert this so we keep the same. So when we set the bit, we want to say register if p value, we want to set the bit to register the value. Uh, that will be or equal let's put some music again and let's go one shifted the number of bit order So whatever is the value before in the register, it will set a one in the in the bit in the order. In, in the opposite way, in register value, we want to remove the bit. So we are going to make an AND and let's invert, inverse this uh, binary operation. So let's use this symbol to invert the integer. So uh, let's write an example in here. Uh, 0 b 0 0 1 0 0 that is five six seven eight equals to zero b one one zero one 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 yep that is basically it that that is what the this operator does and And now for getting the bit, uh, instead of choose true, let's return register value and one shifted by bit order. And that should be automatically casted to a boolean, right? Because it returns a boolean. So yeah, this is basically it. So our register flags. Now we can have uh, an NES register flag. Does this point to the right class? No, maybe I need to, to use CPU dot register flags. Is this name of the class correct? Seems so. Let's just try it for now and let's use this class instead. So now we can have variables for each of the flags of our program so let's give it a shot it's 
there was some nice uh, code in here that I have seen somewhere yes here we go so this is what are each of the flags so zero is the C Uh, bit flag dot new as insert as the as the register flags and zero as the bit order and now let's use bit id B and the last one would be N. Sorry, B and N. So these are the register flags, and this is zero, one, two, three, four, five is the new set, six and seven. So now that we have the flags registered, we can use uh, flags dot uh, dot value equals param equals so the value variable does not exist yet but we can easily create it so instead of calling the set bit and get bit we can have bar value which is a boolean and this uses set equals get bit and get sorry set equals set bit and get equals get bit is it like this yes it is so for the setter it will use set bit and for the getter it will use get bit this is similar to making this uh, set bit and then calling the function in here set bit bit and then get return get bit so this is totally equivalent code just goes in one line and has an extra uh, an extra value that is that if I am changing this variable inside of your setter it will not call the, the setter again that is something that happened if you if you do it like this so if you want to try to set value in here like value equals p value If you have it written like this, it will call the setter again, then enters, and call the setter again, and enters, and call the setter again. So using this other notation avoids that issue. So it's actually the, the way to go in my opinion. Uh, it should always be written like this. I, I'm wondering if I can make it in a new line. Yeah, seems like I do. I am experimenting a little. Okay, it needs to have the colon. Or semicolon. I, I don't know the names of the symbols in English. It's a comma to me. So 
but we are getting there. So now the state flags equal equals to if the value that we are setting is a zero or not, and the negative flag. will be equal to whether or not our value is negative which is if the if this bit the this eighth bit is set to a one so so far so good can we test this Let's give it a try. Uh, let's go to our test. And let's go... Let's create, delete this line, delete process, and let's make a function. Uh, test LDA. So we will take the CPU and run the program. And let's see if we can take it from from our web page. So this is how he tests LDA. And this is how he tests the zero flag. So eh, let's just take the same name. Why not? So he takes the CPU, creates a new CPU. Yeah, I I can probably do that. Create a new CPU inside the test. And I can run the program, which is a vector with these values on it. Now we can make assertions. Assert. CPU dot register. A. Oh right, it's not a CPU, it's a nest CPU. So register A dot value equals to was it zero x zero five seems though. So. And we can now check if the flag dot um, dot set dot value is false apparently. And the negative flag is also false. It should not be. It should be false. Because this number is not negative and is not zero. Uh, we can also try. Instead of this, let's try a negative number. Let's try a one, two, three, four. So this should be minus one. And let's make the same assertion. And this should be equals to minus one, of course. And it is not zero, but it is negative. Now it is 
Let's make another run again. And let's just pass zero. And this time, value should be zero. Zero should be true. And negative should be false. So let's see what happens with my assertions. Print test pass it. So let's give it a try. I see nothing and that is because I did not run my test. Test pass it! Yay! Wow! So now let's try to make it fade. So what happens if we point a stereo here? It expects to see it to be false, so this one should assert in here. Okay, test fails. So indeed, uh, right, it, it failed in here, of course. So let's try it. Try it again. And yes, indeed, it fails in the line that we expected. So tests are working. So this one test LDA test zero and negative flags. Uh, and seems to work perfectly fine. Um, so let's see what is the other test in here. Yeah, I have a little trouble because I only have one monitor. Uh, I should be, I should have two monitors next week. Mm-hmm. Just checking. Yes, I am still alone. <laughs> so sad. Anyway. The other test tries exactly what I did. It tests the zero flat. So it is all the same. Right, let's try implement another opcode. Transfer A to X. This one is also straightforward. Copy the value from A to X. So the, the opcode is OXAA. Let's go to our interpreter. So this one does not take a parameter, just takes uh, what what is what was the value from and to uh, from a to x, okay? So it's register x the value equal register a dot value that's fine and now do, do, do. same tests uh, for this the parameter in this case is register a so let's use register a dot value instead of param and we are already done apparently because we have ab abstracted this uh, inside the 
the flag trap. So that that that's how it is. Don't forget to write the test. So let's copy this test and put it in our test function. Our test uh, stuff. So this is a variable CPU equals nest CPU dot new this was probably not the, the best the best idea to copy it like this but we are done Let's run the test. So let's read what the code that I translated manually to does. So we create a new CPU, we set the value of the register A immediately without running anything. And then we run the program and we check if the value of register A is equal uh, to zero, apparently. Oh, sorry, it should be 10. Because we, we are setting a 10 in here. It's really using... Yes, it's using decimal notation. So yes, yeah, so this will copy from A to X. So we, it X should have the value of 10 after this. And also it... Uh, Zero should be false because it's not zero, and negative should be false because it's not negative. So let's see if it passes. Yes, it passed. So now let's try again. With a different value, let's try a negative value. should be equals to this. It's not zero, but it is negative. Does it pass? It does pass. Now let's try with the third case. A zero value. Uh, I, I want to split this test. What did I do wrong? Okay, I, I forgot to copy this line. That was it. So this one is zero. And I will copy and this should be equal to zero. It is zero and it is not negative. And let's see if this passes. Everything passes. This works. So, okay, can I make it break the test? It breaks. Yay! We are doing great. The, the, I don't usually make tests while programming, but in this so abstract use case, 
uh, helps a lot to see progress. So we have transferred uh, before moving to the next opcode, we have to admit that our code is quite convoluted. The interpret method is already complicated and does multiple things. There is a noticeable duplication between the way tax and LDA are implemented. Let's fix that. So now we have an LDA and a tax function that sets the value and update the, the flags right um, I think I will for now skip this well, it's okay let's let's just do it as I expected to do because I have thought of this I have already read that documentation and I have an idea in my own mind how to make this work and I want to have a function that instead of LDA I want to name it to something different Put it in here. Load register, and I want to take a register as, a, as an argument. <coughs> so I will take parameter register as the yes. This would be the the eight bit. Version of load, right? So we take a register. What was the name of the class? Eight bits. And what is the value? So what LDA does is wait oh, it passes the value indeed mm -hmm. so yes it is still getting the the parameter inside the match so let's go um, this part is what goes inside load register what are you opening that so this is p register and this is p value This is update set and flags p value, and now I can have this update set and flags. And I already have LDA and now I can make a function for transfer register from to so I can have my two arguments P from and P 
Chu. So I can say P Chu dot value equals P from dot value. And I can update the, the zero and negative flags with P from value. Um, that's it. So now I can use this. Uh, it's tax, uh, what, right? It's tax. Not nothing to do with taxes. So now I can change this to load register. Register A with param and get rid of this. And Transfer register from A to X and forget of the flat. Yeah, that's better. Let's see if our program, our test, still passes. All clear! So now that, unlike uh, the tutorial in, in Rust, we are working with classes for registers instead of atomic values. And that help us to, to make these these reusable functions what did actually in ROS you can use reference to, to an atomic value and we cannot do that in the dough and that is why we need to wrap it in, in a class but this is still cool right so let's move on Um. So we have LDA, we have tax, we have update, seed and end flags, and we still have interpret just the way. Okay, the code looks more manageable now. Hope our tests are still passing. I cannot emphasize and know the importance of writing tests for all of the old codes we are implementing. The operations themselves are almost trivial, but tiny mistakes can cause unpredictable ripples in game logic. Uh, like this one, I guess? <laughs> yeah, that should not happen. Implementing the last of code from the program should not be a problem. I will leave this an, a, as an exercise to you. When you are done, this test should pass. So the last is increment x. So let's make... Uh, first of all, let's find the, the table the reference and find in x and let's see let, let's see how it is expected to work so it can set zero it can set negative and nothing else so let's make a function for in x makes actually another version of ink c so it's basically ink c instead of ink x in x so let's use 
increment register and we pass the register as an argument and we say value equals to p register plus one oops so now value is adding one to the previous register value but it can uh, byte it can byte override um, sorry not override overflow so I am a little strange that the overflow flag is not affected Adds one to the value held at the specified memory location, setting zero and negative flags as upper create. Adds one to the X register, setting zero and negative flag. And in Y, adds one to the Y register, setting zero and negative flags as upper create. So apparently the overflow um, does not apply in here. So let, let's move on and let's forget about it. So uh, P register equals to bar and and let's take our eight bits of binary one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we will not have garbage our, after our 8 bits, right? Uh, right, this is register value. And now, uh, we update 0 and negative flags with P register and value. So that should be all for this little program. And we need to try to make the test for it. When you are done, this test should work. Function test five oops working together. We create a new CPU, no initialization, and then we run the code. Want to get rid of this? Replace no columns in my code, and this is the test. And here goes the assertion. Assert CPU register X value equals this and let's execute the code and let's also copy the other the increment overflow one. Uh, 
let's copy this test uh, set the register x 0 ff and then runs the program which is a little different and then checks that the value should be a 1 because it starts with ff and then increments twice and that's all oh by the way I created the function for increment register but I never added the function um, for ink x so ink x is e5 so this one is increment register of register x but we can also read the app increment uh, of the a yeah but this one takes an argument it is not by one let's just make the, the x and y version y is c8 and increment the value of y register so let's see if our test passes Oh, right, I forgot to... So I know it passed because it didn't assert, but I forgot to, to... to make a print for each. So yay, everything passes! I am making a little break for going to the bathroom. So be back in a minute. Okay, that was fast. Um, so, in X, 
is testing the X register but it's not testing the Y register so let's also uh, test both of them It's so sad that uppercase and lowercase are mixed. Up. Oops. I should not have overridden. So this program increases x twice, uh, twice, and increases y twice, or maybe three times. And we start with FE now. Let's test this like this just for fun, right? We need to make it interesting. Uh, this is break, and we have not implemented it, but let's forget it for now. I guess we can implement break. Yeah, so this is increment y. Break. And this breaks. Uh, the loop and it's actually important to, to have it because if we don't have it this this test could be failing incorrect uh, could be passing incorrectly because the, there could be a zero zero somewhere that is not expected to be read as an instruction and it will just skip it and that's not something we want right so let's see if this is still passing and it does it does pass increase y so I am uh, already a uh, step ahead from the tutorial that's great so next page memory addressing modes in our initial implementation, the CPU receives instructions as separate in input stream. This is not how things work in the an actual NES. NES implements typical von Neumann architecture. Both data and instructions are stored in memory. The executed code is data from the CPU pers perspective and any data can potentially be interpreted as executable code. There is no way the CPU can tell the difference. The only mechanism the CPU has is a program counter. Register that keeps track of the position in the input stream. Let's sketch this out in our CPU code. So the changes in this CPU is this CPU now has a ve uh, vector to store the memory and it has memory read, memory write and, and a load and run function that loads and then runs the, 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 the program so Let's give it a try. So yes, it has the memory embedded inside the CPU. That is not exactly what should happen, right? Because the memory is a separate um, physical object in the in the architecture. 
Okay, so there is the CPU and there is the RAM. So, oh, I see. So it's one for the CPU and one for the picture programming unit. But the CPU access to both of them using different mapping. So it, the point is, uh, in the end, it all becomes a unique memory. And it should not matter. Uh, it should not be owned by any by anything. So what I want to do is instead of putting the memory on the CPU, is having a memory member, a memory class that can be shared between many uh, classes. So, I will for now uh, create a script for the memory. Does that make sense? So, yes, it does make sense. It does. Last name memory. Yeah. It's a such a generic name, but let's stick to it. And this extends ref counted. And what it has is the uh, Should it be called memory? Yeah, let's start it map of type uh, packet byte array. And when a memory is created, Size is passed and map is resized to that value. And then fill it with zeros and we can have a reset function That does actually this. We can just call reset in here. So here goes nothing. <coughs> we now have a uh, a memory a memory class that can be accessed and written. So let's add the read and write functions to, to this class instead of to the CPU. Because we want these functions to be called also from other places like the PPU or the APU or whatever. Mm, or at least access it. The PPU will not set anything but it will read it. Uh, ta -ta. So, memory read and memory write. Memory read takes an address. Oh, right. So, and the address is an integer. So, this is the thing, we want addresses to not go over the size, so let's, to, to, let's make an assertion 
making sure the address is in range so address is bigger or equal to zero and address is less than map.size we indeed may even may make this map private and only and only allow to access it from the functions that should be better so it could even be it could indeed be called memory so we can choose uh, Keep the naming of the tutorial that I'm, we are following. So, read memory, we just return the value from the array. Punk right sorry man right and let's go with the address as well and the value and this will return an integer I I always forget to add the return values to the functions, especially the ones that return void. Uh, this one is called data. Let's not let's not do that. So we have to assert that the address is in range, and we have to assert. value uh, is less or equal to our maximum value which is which is 0 x ff because memories are of one byte so the thing with the assertions is that they are removed when you are compiling for release so they, they, they will only work when, when you are uh, executing from the editor if you export your project then the assertions are removed so that's why they are, they are it is important to not run code in your assertion because it, it will be removed so you want to always just test values of uh, variables distorted and not run code and then check what is the value that is uh, returned from that code so this one is memory address equals p value so this is great so now cpu has a memory member Should I initialize it in here? No, I, I will just make it equals to new. 
and in the wrong method let's assert memory is not equal to no and we have the same assertion in the NES run method okay we are ready to continue now we have a memory that we can initialize in here with a size of Uh, o F F F F So far so good Oh and I forgot to put the as a register The P register That is equals to the flag Let's call it P if I am not wrong Mm -hmm. So now we have we are missing load and run, which does the load on the run, and we can split the the loading and the running. So let's add those functions. Load and run takes the program and it calls load with P program as argument. Uh, uh, this is a problem because load is a uh, reserve. That is the word I could not remember today. So load is a reserve, but I can use self that load to avoid that confusion, right? I should be able to pass this. And now it should not fail, Aston. So it loads and then. And this. Load and run. Uh, should be working. Actually. In the base class. So load and run. Uh, load and run function should be on the base class and all CPUs should call it like that so the NES don't need it anymore and the load function should be a um, a virtual method load and this method needs to be overwritten and run no longer takes an argument run no longer takes an argument so load is an override of the CPU load function so, P program does 
no longer exist in RON and that is because now we are using the memory memory uh, mem read the value uh, this is not an array oops I'm not used to this keyboard uh, this is an endless loop now because we will use the break for quitting uh, this should also be a memory read instead of using the program Oops. awesome so now what we are missing is loading the, the the program so what this function does is copy the program into the memory starting on address 0 0800 um, so I don't know if there is a, a short version of that Let's see the code and go duplicate the compress compress field field hex and code insert empty push back remove or find set There is a plus, an equal operator, and not equal, and loop. So what we are going to do is for i in size of the program we are going to say memory mem set or mem write zero x eight thousand plus y and let's pass the program plus y and before this no we should not press it right yeah let's not press it the memory because there could be memory that we want to keep I don't know uh, what I am doing wrong Oh, it's the program at i, not plus y. Sorry, it's not y, it's e, right? A, sorry, I'm not native speaker. So sometimes I forget the very basic stuff that you don't use every day. I did not repeat 1000 times the uh best study yeah so that should be uh. <coughs> I'm sorry Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, this was exactly that does not set any value after the size of the program. So this should be 
working except that our tests are now calling run and they should be calling load and run let's see if they still passes and they doesn't so what is failing here create a new CPU program counter memory creates the register register the registers creates memory now load and run enters load uh, in the program size starts to write the memory address is yes it's not represented as as hex but let's see how this could work why is this not advancing I'm taking a break. Hey! Two hours later.
Ok, should start with more, more interruption. We should be able to continue now. But looks like Kuto is having a bad time. Let's have to restart it. Get started. Memory is not new. Oh, program counter should not be set to zero. That was it. Let's go again. And test process. That's great. So let's put power to the tutorial and continue. So it load and run, load and run. All of them is correct. We have just created an array for the whole memory 64 kilobytes of address space. As we discussed in a future chapter, CPU has only 2 kilobytes of RAM, and everything else is reserved for memory mapping. The whole the load program code into memory starting at address 8000. We have discussed that 8000 to FFFF is reserved for the program ROM, and we can assume that instructions stream should start somewhere in this space, not necessarily at, the, at 8000. Nest platform has a special mechanism to mark where the CPU should start the execution. Upon inserting the new cartridge, the CPU receives a special signal called Reset Interrupt that instructs the CPU to reset the state, register and flag, and set program counter to the 16 bit address that is stored in FFFC. Before implementing that, I should briefly mention that the NES CPU can address. 65,536 memory style. It takes 2 bytes to store an address. Any CPU is little endianness, addressing rather than being endian. That means that the 8 bits less bit significant bits in the address will be stored before the 8 most significant bits. To illustrate, this is the difference. Real address 8,000. With big endian, you write it like 80.00, with little endian, 80. So, for example, the instruction to read data from memory cell 8000 8, into A register would look like LD8 8000 AD 80. We can implement this behavior using some of the rules with arithmetic. So, basically, we are going to have a memory read and write for 16 bits. So, let's do that. Uh, memory use 16. No, this is not. But, oh. Our memory will have function memory 16 from address and address is an unsigned integer of 16 and memset is 
quite the same. But let's see how this works. So reads. Stupid. I will close this. Ah, you gotta be kidding me. Okay. This is bar, bar, no letting, low memory is memory from address, and high memory is load memory from address plus one. And then we are going to return. High and low with the or okay, this works. Man, write sixteen. Let's copy the code. Change let for bar uh, these are uh, integers Ta -ta -ta. Oh, wait I also want to erase all of these So I want to retake, re rename data to p value and post to address. So there we go. And high value is gonna be p value shifted eight bits to the right, and low value is gonna be just the left. Um, values the first eight values of the of the p value and then we are going to store it into address and address plus one first the low then the high because of the little Indian so that works now we can implement reset functionality properly we will have to choose the load and load and run functions load method should load the program into program room space and save the reference of the code into fff memory cell reset method should restore the state of our registers and initialize the program counter by the two byte value stored in fff so we need a reset function. Ba -ba -bam. So we are going to have a func reset that we want to assert to make us an override so load is going to call reset first right no load is not calling reset load and run is calling reset Okay. So 
now our NES needs to have its own reset function. Reset function should set all registers 0 A, X, Y, and flat Right? X, Y and program counter should be equal to whatever is stored in this memory. Program counter dot value equals memory dot read uh, mem read sixteen of the hard coded value and FFFC Okay, that works So now, load Besides setting the, the, the memory Instead of setting the PC The program counter It is going to store The starting value Into FFFC So instead of Setting the program counter directly, it is going to call memory mem write 16 and the address is gonna be FFFC and the value 8000. No, it's mem write, not mem read. Okay, load, reset, run, don't forget to fix the failing test now, alright, that was the easy part, let's see if this still passes, nope, uh, wonder why, Load, rested. And load is happening before rested. And why is this failing? So, A, A, zero, zero. What was this? Oh, I see. Because now I cannot set the register before loading and running. Because load and run is going to... to destroy the register value. So this test no longer works. Work. A door. Mm. Remember LDA opcodes we implemented in the last chapter? The symbol, the single mnemonic LDA actually can be translated into eight different machine instructions depending on the type of parameter. So apparently we can't simply not use not set the register so we are going to have to to use LDA in our program instead so we have to do it like this LDA then and then transfer it Here it is 
and the A and this binary number and this one goes away and this one LDA 0 and this one goes away and now this test should be passing yep that one passed so now we have to fix the variable overflow but we don't have LDA to so this is what we we, we are going to have to do uh, we are going to use LDA and we are going to load in the A register FF and then we are going to transfer to X what was the name transfer from to this one AA is transfer to X and now transfer to Y which we did not implement, but it, it is quite easy. Um, reference tie and the value is a a. O x. A8 Transfer Y Transfer X And transfer from A to X to Y Okay, now we have transfer Y and we can use it in our text so we load ff transfer it to x and transfer it to y and we no longer need this and this test should now pass and this one is not accessing the uh, the registers before executing the code so yay our test passes Cool, cool. So, this is moving fast. I like it. So, don't forget fixing failing tests. We should still. Alright, that was the easy part. Remember, LDA of code were implemented last chapter. The single mnemonic LDA actually can be translated in eight different machine instructions depending on the type of parameter. So yes, this is basically how you write the LDA. So You can read about addressing modes here and here, I'm not going to, because I already know more or less what it is about, but let's see. In short, addressing mode is a property of a fun of an instruction that defines how the CPU should interpre interpret the next one or two bytes in the instruction stream. Different addressing modes has different instruction sizes. For example, zero page version has a size of 2 bytes, one for the opcode and one for a parameter. That's why zero page addressing can be reference can reference memory about the first 250 bytes. So the, the thing with this is that if you are making an oops, that was not it. If 
you're making an LDA of an ad of an address uh, I don't know one zero it is going it needs only one byte to to get the the value if you are uh, making an LDA and storing the explicit value it only needs one byte but if you are making an LDA and referencing a memory address that is not in the first FF that is 255 it is going to need uh, two bytes to reference it let's say OX um, 1040 uh, this is also OX OX so this is a memory address this is a literal and this is a memory address but the D that has 16 bits instead of 8 so all of them uses LDA for the for the instruction name but when the compiler compiles it they are referenced using different opcodes that is each one of these the one that we implemented is A9 I think let me check yes it's A9 but these other variations are all the other notations that you can write in, in the way that I type it in here and there is also LDA X and LDA Y I think and it's not exactly like that but it's um, an example of how they they can be uh, ac ac actually I am not convinced of that but I, I am not sure how you you uh, reference these ones the absolute and indirect with offset yet but we don't we don't Okay, about that, we only need the opcodes and the implementation. So, there are no opcodes that occupy more than 3 bytes. CPU instruction size can be either 1, 2, or 3 bytes. The majority of CPU instructions provide more than one addressing alternative. Ideally, we don't want to re implement the same addressing mode logic for every CPU instruction. Let's try to codify how the CPU should interpret uh, different addressing modes. So we have an enum for all the, the addressing uh, modes that are listed in the reference. Um. So this is quite uh, generic, but I think uh, this list is specific for NES, so I am putting in the NES uh, section of the code. We're making our enum in the top, probably. So NES view has this addressing mode, and we have get operand address. And for every uh, addressing mode, there is 
So what this method does is it returns the the the, po the value in the memory where the next value is stored. That's what it does. So there is a quite lot of them. So let's go one of them at a time. So the way we are going to uh, implement it is let's make a a virtual method that takes uh, an addressing mode but it takes it as an integer instead of a type and it is going to return an int for the address Okay. So the first thing is matching the, the mode. And this is going to make an assert for I am forgetting something. This does not come here. This comes here. And this one goes to the NES view. And we get rid of the address. So now we want to assert the mode is in the addressing mode values So this this assert theoretically already takes care of this but we are leaving it anyway just for the sake of completion and I guess we return zero here uh, what does it does here oh it says panic okay but we need a return value so we we are going to keep it so, addressing mode immediate, it just returns the program counter. Why is it not autocompleting? Maybe as addressing mode mediate return problem counter value. There we go. Addressing mode uh, zero page. Why is it not autocompleting? You know what? Okay, so this one is going to read the memory from program counter and then return that. Return memory, uh, mem read, 
pero voy a encontrar Bali. So the first one is going to return the memory of the program counter. The second one is the pointer. So the program counter is pointed to where the memory is located. So this would be, as an example, LDA, and this is just a literal. Because uh, the program counter will be pointing to where this is stored. So this is this translates to OX AA was it? No A9 OX then So, the program counter holds uh, this value, so returning the program counter will return the, the address where this is stored. This other case, zero page, is this one. And this one is the page is A5. So when the cardinal saying this is the literal set the compiler will set A9 when the cardinal is not set the compiler is going to set A5 and bo both of them are LDA and well, the only thing that changes is where the value is taken from so let's continue with the other uh, so absolute Addressing absolutely, and this is going to return read the sixteen bit instead of the of an eight bit. Uh, I will explain it right away. Memory mem read sixteen. Program counter dot value. So what is the difference from this to this? The, this is the only difference. Instead of having a one byte, we are going to have two bytes. So this is going to be. Remember, this is lit, little endianess. So this is going to be OX90. OX10 and absolute is AD command right are inverted because of little endianess all right next addressing mode is we have done zero page x y Zero page X and Y. 
tem quanto Rafinha de fora absoluto isso correto yes. duplicate for y and let's see what it does so it is going to read the memory position from the program counter and it will add to it whatever is in the X or Y register so let's do that uh, bar position int it's going to do memory read mem program counter value and uh, address is going to be uh, wrapping up it's position wrapping up x I need to check what is wrapping up for the for now let's do position plus register x that value uh, a pass here for now and return address now I need to check what this does Returns A plus B modulus of 2 to the end where N is the width of T in B. So that means is this the same as the overflow? So I think this is the same as shifting 8 bits if there is an overflow. So that is if post is bigger than OXFF, the reason not post is address address less equal OXFF and that is what WAP should be about which is what I understood from the name of the variable anyway this one is the same as this one but it uses Y instead of X right two down Absolute X and Y and quite sure of how this one is written in the LDA maybe LDA is not supported yeah, still page X is supported on LDA but not in Y it takes 2 bytes 4 cycles mm, there is LDX and LDY which is basically the same but loading in X and Y <sighs> 
Calm down. I am not sure of how this is written in Assembler, but it, I don't care right now. Let's just move on. Absolute X and Y. So, this is the same piece, but it's a 16 bits instead of 2 bits. So it's the same comparison from this to this. So let's see. It's absolute, which is a read there, and absolute x y. This one we have a base that is equals to memory. We had sixteen. Okay, this is an integer. And address is going to be base plus register x. Uh, so it's base, and then this is all the same. So the only difference is it is reading 16 instead of 8 bits. was 8 bits this instead is 16 bits so this one is not FF it is FFFF alright let's go the same with register Y Two less indirect x. Oh, this is getting tricky. Indirect x and indirect y. Uh, when I read these ones the first time, I found it interesting that they are different in implementation. And if you look at the at the usage. In LDA, you can see that indirect uses X parenthesis and this is indirect parenthesis Y. So that that is that is so weird. <laughs> so we will just accept it. There is no reason to be crazy about this. So let's take this so it's indirect x past indirect y pass. Uh, let's see 
what do we have in here? Change lead for bar. So this is memory, mem read, program counter, value. This U8 is an integer. Base, wrapping up, register x dot value. Uh, this wrapping up is actually this. So we need to change address here for pointer and this add is changed by just an addition operation so now notice that this one says address and this one says pointer and that is because we, uh, we have read the memory from the program counter and now we are reading the, the memory from the from that value that we have read so this is a kind of a pointer to pointer so this is memory memory pointer So yes, this is the same, right? I could do this instead. Because unlike Rust, we have 16 bytes in the share so we can do this operation without uh, risking an overflow in our val uh, atomic value Okay. Low memory, high memory. High memory goes to the to the left, and low memory goes to the right. So yay! One, another one down! That's great! So because this one is different, I am not going to copy and paste. 
episode the difference between the indirect x and the indirect y is that the x gets the value as x and then gets the new value and the indirect y gets the value adds the y and then gets the new value more or less I think Let's change let for bar Let's change the for memory let set type hints So base is memory read program counter value. No memory read base. High memory read base plus one. Why is this happening? Why is it wrapping? It's it's turning a bit into a sixteen bit. Okay. Rest base. Shift the high or the low bitwise and the rest is add and wrap register Y. Add and wrap um, and is this eight or sixteen wrap? Let me check it. It's sixteen wrap. Yes, all the values returned are sixteen. Sixteen here, sixteen here, sixteen here, sixteen here. I can improve a little the math. This one is not 16, but this because uh, zero page does not uh, does not go beyond that value ever. This one is 
like this. And this one is like this. And that should be all. Famous last words. Could not resolve CPU. Ah. Artlist IO. Okay. We have address mapping working. Music licensing reimagined. So with this in mind, music licensing reimagined. We can move on to change this for something that is even more uh, generic. I am quite tired right now, so I think this is the end of the stream. I would like to end this chapter uh, before leaving, but I am too tired, honestly. This is the end. Thank you for watching. See you later. Music licensing reimagined.